In 2016, the Supreme Court struck down key tenets of the Scottish Government's Named Person Scheme. Five years on, we're speaking to those involved in the successful No to Named Persons campaign and taking a look back at that long road to victory. I spoke to Stuart Wayton, a senior lecturer in sociology and criminology at the University of Abate in Dundee, an early opponent of the scheme. Stuart, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, why don't we start by talking about why you joined the No to Name Persons campaign? It just seemed uh, one of the most, if not the most, uh, stark and worrying example of uh, the increasingly authoritarian nature of politics and practices in Scotland. And that's my, my if you like, my, I'm writing a book at the minute called The Criminalization of Everything. And one of the chapters is going to be looking at people's personal life. And I, I think that is probably the most important area in terms of how things are developing and changing, where you have the state increasingly thinking that it should be determining uh, the minute uh, or the minutiae of everyday life in families and personal relationships and interactions, um, uh, which is kind of a, a major concern I have. And so the, the name person came along and my jaw dropped. Uh, and I thought, right, I can't just let that lie. Uh, so I tried to do something about it. And so what was your involvement in the campaign? What, what was your day-to-day -day, uh, jobs? And, and... Um, my involvement, I um, helped set up, this is my memory's terrible, but I'll try and I, I helped to set up and organise speakers for the opening conference that we had or the launch of mm. the what became the Note and the In-Person campaign. Um, I then, I wrote articles about it. I wrote uh, a paper, an academic journal paper uh, on the subject, and I was involved in the roadshows. So I either spoke at or chaired the, I think it was around 20 roadshows around various towns and cities in Scotland to raise the profile of this. And one of the reasons I was very keen to do that is because um, I think ultimately the way that this type of um, sort of politics, if you like, will be stopped is when the public take a much more active role in stopping it. So whether that's parents or in the form of parents or whatever form it takes, um, that's that's what I'm very keen to do because uh, I know you can try and use the law, which is ultimately how the named person was stopped, but I don't think that's ever going to be enough because um, I don't think we can trust judges to protect our liberties. I think the only way we can protect liberties is if we ourselves uh, decide that we're going to uh, make sure that we have them. You've mentioned there that you, uh, you spoke out in the media, academic journals. What was it about the name person scheme that riled you so much? Well, it's when you look at the detail of what was being proposed, it was essentially that you would have uh, what critics called a state guardian uh, overseeing the intricate detail to a phenomenal degree of uh, a child's life and how their parents related to that child. Almost every professional was now there to um, is, is spy, uh, too strong a word, I don't know if it is, but essentially to look at the child as something that was in danger uh, and that needed um, you know, protection and support in every aspect of their lives. You think, well, where, where's the, where is the role for the parent uh, within this framework? It didn't seem to uh, occur to the, uh, the great minds that were developing this, that this might uh, seriously undermine parental autonomy and authority. Um, so yeah, it just seemed um, a, a profoundly authoritarian Orwellian development. Mm. Uh, well, uh, at the time the campaign was running, you were writing articles 
uh, criticizing the scheme, but at least initially, did you have any pushback? Did you find uh, there was difficulty getting people to publish those articles? Um, uh, not really, I think. I, I actually think it was one of those issues that uh, you didn't have to be particularly um, peculiar to think there was something a bit troubling here. Uh, it, it, it was more obviously the more conservative newspapers uh, w were prepared to look at it, but even the sort of Scottish press, which is a little bit more mainstream, if you like, were were raising or were prepared to raise uh, some concerns about it. So I, I think, and especially the idea of a state guardian and um, a kind of nanny statish feel to it, I do think there was. There was a bit of scope uh, from the outset to uh, make a certain um, issue out of this. I mean, the, the problem is that we have a situation which, again, what was, what was it I was reading just now? There's another bill just gone through that was on the, on COVID. That's right, where you have uh, about 90 MSPs vote one way and about 25 vote the other way. And this is the problem we've got, is that on all these sort of initiatives, um, like the named person, like the smacking bill, uh, like the hate crime act, you have this um, complete imbalance in terms of the public and the new political elites, where the political elites, about 85% of them uh, think one thing, uh, and about 15% of them think another. And then if you ask the public, do you think the name person is a great idea? Do you think we should like criminalize smacking? Do you think we should arrest people for uh, saying incorrect things in their own house, which is now the law in Scotland? You would have the reverse. You'd have around 85% or 75% of the public would say no to these things, which is one of the extraordinary um, aspects of Scottish politics is how out of kilter the politicians are from uh, the public and the, you know the majority of the public were not in favor of the main person and they're, they're not in favor of many of these other initiatives but it makes no difference and that's that's where the difficulty lies i think is uh, how do you stop them, something in scotland in particular when the political class sing largely with one voice and it's usually only the conservatives uh, who stand in opposition to it mm. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you spoke out uh, at these public meetings as well. Um, what were the arguments that you typically used to try and convey the dangers of the scheme to the public? Uh, well, I think it, it was in part, it was to try and point out that this was a shift away from the idea that you should intervene in a family's life from the uh, a kind of welfare framework to a well-being framework. And what that meant was, what, what they meant by well-being is almost anything. You know, it's like the happiness of the child, what makes a child happy? Well, you know, are they happy when you won't let them watch uh, what they want on the television or when you won't let them decorate their bedroom in the way that they see fit? And so on, these were sort of examples that were used uh, as well as part of well-being indicators. So you had this real shift from the idea that you should only intervene in a family uh, in terms of seeing it as being problematic and needing uh, sort of social services, social work and state intervention. You should only do that when there's something seriously problematic to a situation where you're saying, well, we should now intervene with almost anything, you know, almost any indicator that a teacher or a health visitor, you know, what, what, whatever they see as being potentially not quite right then that can be a framework for intervention. And once you have state intervention in your family, there's all sorts of problems with that. And I think people are conscious of that. You know, people are conscious of the fact that, you know, the, the state doesn't have a great record. You know, there's this, there is something really problematic about seeing all the different turmoils and difficulties and anxieties and angers and behaviors in a family. Uh, all almost all of which within this kind of new well-being framework could be seen as something that the state needs to get involved in. And it really, and, and, I mean, and this isn't just the main person, this is something that's been developing for a while through the 
the, uh, the idea of every child matters or GERFEC, uh, get it right for every child in Scotland. There's been a shift in this direction for a couple of decades now, or a little bit more than that, um, where you change the relationship between the professional and the parent. And increasingly, the professional is being encouraged to look at the parent as a, as a risk factor. Yeah, you know, something that, uh, or somebody who uh, is problematic. Uh, and the child, which is, this is, I'm just like the chapter on this at the minute, which reminds me I should include this aspect into it. Um, the child is seen as profoundly vulnerable. That seems to be one of the, the most important new categories that's developed over recent times where the essence of the child is vulnerability. And once you have that perception of the child as being essentially vulnerable, uh, then they're vulnerable to almost everything and anything. Uh, and that lays the framework for intervention into potentially millions uh, of families' lives based on what the vast majority of people would think is, um, is completely unnecessary and potentially dangerous. And the thing is, just to, to add to this, one of the things that's worth noting about this is that it doesn't really matter the extent to which the authorities get involved. It's the very fact that you are creating this new, different framework where professionals and parents are almost uh, loggerheads with each other, right? But so rather than being seen as collaborators in helping to uh, you know, grow and socialize the next generation, for parents will start to become worried and nervous and suspicious and anxious about professions. And it could have a really detrimental impact on what should be a positive and kind of almost collective uh, endeavor. Uh, not that you want teachers to get too involved in all aspects of life, but you do want to have a, you know, the, vill the village to help a child grow and all the rest of it. You do want this, this collective adult responsibility for children. And this was almost creating this tension between different sections of the adult population where parents are increasingly seen as being something, you know, a, a body of people who need to be surveyed almost uh, through their children, rather than having this more uh, cooperative kind of um, uh, relationship. So they, they were some of the arguments that uh, I would try and make. And, and how do you feel that the public responded to those arguments? Yeah, I think quite well. Uh, I think at the road shows, the, the main people who were a bit defensive about it were people who were either parents and social workers or parents and teachers or had just come along because they were teachers and parents and uh, who, to a certain extent, they've, they've come to understand and think of their role through this protective framework um, and they would feel a bit defensive about being seen as uh, having a Kafkaesque or, or Orwellian dimension to it because they didn't think of themselves like that right? understandably they thought of themselves as good people who just wanted to help and support uh, children um, you know and to some some of those people you could you could sway a bit others uh, I think were more set in their ways in terms of their uh, kind of their role, which is slightly more um, paternalistic and patronizing kind of attitude towards parents, especially working class parents as well. That's the other dimension of this, is that it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't directly class related, but like all of these things, you know the way it's going to pan out is that it's going to be the more working class and the poorer parents who are uh, seen with a little bit more suspicion by some teachers and some uh, social workers than others. So there was some, there was some opposition there, um, but I think in general, um, um, the arguments were fairly well supported. And you, it was quite clear to a lot of people, uh, especially who came to the roadshow because they were concerned about it. It was quite clear to them that there was a shift um, in the wrong direction in terms of how the state was relating to parents. Well, I think that's a, a good place for us to end. But uh, thank you very much for speaking to me today, Stuart. It's been uh, a real help. Thank you.